Good afternoon, New York City here again, and a hot and sunny, muggy day it is here. And it was yesterday too. It's all right. Okay, so I'm continuing with nuclear physics. Some people emailed me and texted me to say, oh, this is only high school physics. It begins at that level, but it gets bigger, all right? So, you know, if you're pretty good at scattering theory, you probably don't need to watch the rest of these lectures. If you're pretty good at uh, nuclear reactions in general, then there's a lot more than just uh, saying what happens, the energy comes from, there's a lot more to it than that. But never mind, uh, you can sit back until I move into a new topic. But I am going to finish this topic with about three more lectures after this one. This is part three. And I'm breaking it up into segments because there's a lot of little numbers here and a lot of detail. That it just takes time. It's in my head, don't worry. But it just takes time to write it on the board. And with my back turned to you, writing all this stuff would ruin the video. So the first thing we'll do is we'll begin with some important numbers for our discussion. Now, when I used to buy textbooks, and I haven't bought textbooks for years, but when I did used to buy them, mainly in foils of London, big bookshop on Charing Cross Road. Um, I used to work in a bookshop across the street from it, actually. Anyway, when I did buy books, if I was buying a physics book, the first thing I did was I looked inside the cover, in the front or the back part of the cover, or an appendix. I wanted to see if they had listed the important constants properly. Everybody knows the constant, constant such as the speed of light, Planck's constant, you know, uh, Boltzmann's constant, but there are other ones that, you know, like the gravitational constant, we know what that is, but there are, there are others, are combinations of constants, like 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught 0, the electric constant K, which is 9 by 10 to the power of 9 meters squared, squared over kilograms squared, and also get the units of these constants. If I look through the list and I found, let's say, one of my favorite constants, let's say an obscure one, missing, then I wouldn't get that book. Some people would think, oh, these are the important ones, but there might be one or two very important ones not listed, okay? Now, I can't think offhand of what ones I used to use to, as a filter. Let me think. Important details such as the masses of planets, the masses of the mass of the sun, 2 by 10 to the power of 30 kilograms, um, the radius of the planets, the radius of the sun, the orbital radii, things like that should, should all be included for calculations for students doing classical mechanics, all right? Uh, anyway, you get the picture. Here are some numbers for us, and then we move ahead. I'm going to do this in slices. I'm going to erase this board and put another one on, so there'll be about four slices, episodes if you like. I have to figure out again how to, pay, how to cut and paste to make the video. I did do it once, but I've forgotten how I did it. So, with the, considering the fission of U23592, basically we have a neutron Sorry, a neutron has atomic mass one, atomic number zero, into uranium two, three, five, ninety-two. Now, what's fissionable? Well, certain nuclei are fissionable. Uh, well, U two three five ninety-two is fissionable with slow neutrons. Slow neutrons are about one eV. Intermediate neutrons are about ten to the power of three eV. And fast neutrons are about a million electron volts. Now we also worked out the mass of an atomic mass unit, one twelfth the mass of the unit of uh, the nucleus of carbon, by ten to the power of minus twenty-seven kilograms. Yeah, one that's the mass of the carbon nucleus. Divide that by twelve because that's that's pretty close to uh, atomic mass unit one. Okay, so the energy associated that is just that times c squared, which is 1.49 by 10 to the power of minus 10 joules. U235, fast neutrons can fission that, slow neutrons can fission U235, U238, sorry. Now, another one that's fissionable, uh, of course, fissionable nucleus is plutonium. Plutonium is 239.94. Uh, That's also fissionable by slow neutrons. And this, how we worked out, is 170 MeV per fission as an energy. 
And using Avogadro's number, we will be able to work out the energy released from fissioning one kilogram of that stuff completely. Now what do we get? We get uh, molybdium 9842, possible. There are many possible uh, product nuclei, approximately half uh, the atomic weight of the other one. Zen and 136, not 54. I don't know, one, two, or three, we'll say two neutrons. Now, to get a chain reaction, we need to get more than one neutron. And uh, fortunately, we get two neutrons, so two neutrons go on and fission, two more nuclei, then you get four nuclei fissioned, and if you have, uh, so it's the powers of two, and we call that generations. And we'll take 80 generations of fissions, of events like this, to fission one kilogram of U23592. And we get out of that an energy of 20,000 tons of TNT. We'll work out how that gets done. Let's figure out this, continue with this. So we have Avogadro's number, don't forget, 6.022 by 10 to the power of 23. This is one of the greatest advancements of all time, Avogadro's number. Now I don't think uh, Avogadro actually discovered it. I thought a fellow called Lockschmidt discovered it. So we call it also Lockschmidt's number. Yeah, so you can bamboozle your friends by calling it Sorry, it's this one down here. No, it's not. It's up there. Now, that means that 6. Avogadro's number nuclei of U23592 weighs 235 grams, and that's one mole. One mole of 235 uh, U235 is 9 grams, so we can figure out a lot of things to do with that that we could figure out the energy produced fissioning, fissioning one gram. Six, six, this number times 170 MeV will be the total energy. We can convert that to joules if you want. Now we carry with us the mass of a proton. 1.6726 by 10 to the power of minus 27 kilograms. Slightly uh, smaller than the mass of a Neutron, 1.67 by 4, 9 by 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, is the mass of a neutron. We can write this in MeV, 938.27 MeV, the mass of a proton, 939.565 MeV, the mass of a neutron. Okay? Now, I said these already. Slow neutrons are about 1 EV. Intermediate neutrons are about 10 to the power of 3 EV. That's 1,000. And fast neutrons are an MeV, one MeV. So, an atomic mass unit, I got that one already, and its energy, and, and these two guys I've discussed. So that's the beginning of our uh, listing our numbers. Here's an example of one of the fission reactions we'll look at. We'll probably look at a couple of others too. We'll work out the energy per each of those reactions, and some things just of interest to show you how the physical calculations get done. And now it's quite amazing the way you can go from a few basic ideas, mainly hanging on Avogadro's number, to find out how much energy you'll get from fissioning a kilogram of um, uranium-235. And you say, how do you, you know that works? Well, they took a kilogram of uranium out in the desert in Alamogordo, New Mexico, in 1945 and fissioned it. Yeah? It was a chain reaction and got energy of 20,000 tons. Actually, it was 14 or 15,000 tons of TNT. But heading in that, that's the order of magnitude. The bomb dropped on uh, Hiroshima had a higher yield, and the one on the plutonium bomb on Nagasaki, an even higher yield still. Now, these are weapons and bombs and awful, but this was wartime. Yeah? War, wars are one. Well, I guess 
couple of hundred years ago, wars were fought just between armies. And this century, I think it was only in the Second World War, that the war was taken home to, to the civilians on both sides. Well, the Japanese had been murdering people all across of Asia. And then they decided to come across to America and do the same thing. So we said, no, we're not having that. And we took arms against them, fought them up, all through the Pacific, island hopped up to Okinawa in contact with uh, close to the Japanese mainland. And there was going to be an invasion. And they recommended that could result in the loss of half a million or more American lives. Well, there'd be lots of there would be lots of Japanese lives, yes. But this is America. We were worried about Japan, uh, not Japanese. We were worried about losing American boys over there to invade the mainland. So somebody, you know, the team down in Los Alamos set the bomb program in motion. Um, first of all, under Roosevelt, and then under uh, President Truman when Ro Roosevelt died. And it had different places. It had a place in Northeast, uh, Oak, Ridge, Oak Ridge in Tennessee, and Los Alamos, of course, in New Mexico. And there were a lot of people involved in this. It was a ma massive endeavor. The science behind it was known, but the big problem was to isolate uranium-235 and plutonium, whatever it was, 239. Okay? So, that's our first our first bit of part three. Next we'll move ahead with part three and I'm going to splice this. So I have to stop this part and give you the next part. Okay, so continuing. We were looking at this reaction and we got, uh, uh, what did we get? The left hand side, 1.09 comet mass units, neutron, that's 235, 0.044 atomic mass units, 235. Now then, on the right hand side we get molybdenum, 98, 97.905 atomic mass units, xenon, 136, 54, 135.917 atomic mass units, and two neutrons, 2.018 atomic mass units, two neutrons. Add up the masses on the left hand side and we get 236.053. Right hand side, we get 235.850 atomic mass units. The difference between the two is 0.213 atomic mass units, okay? The right hand side is less, so we can subtract this from the left hand side to get 0.213 atomic mass units. We'll call that the mass defect, the mass difference, call it what you want. Multiply the mass by c squared, this by c squared, and we get 3.182 by 10 to the power of minus 11 joules, or 198.75 by 10 to the power of 6 eV. Some people write this as MeV. I just like to put in the actual numbers all the time. And that's the energy per fission for this reaction. Now Server, in his little book, I like to follow Server, so that I could, my calculations keep in touch with him. He may use a different reaction. He may use, let's say, this reaction. I didn't work out the energy provision for this reaction. You can go home and do the same thing. Add up the mass units on the left-hand side, the right-hand side, find the difference, and convert it to energy, and so on and so forth. You get some sort of number. But I don't know what reaction he used uh, to get 170 MeV per fission. We're going to stick with this one. Either way, it's all close to 200 MeV per fission. Per fission per nucleus, remember we're looking at U23592. Okay? Now, using this information and the Gadrol's number, we can go and find. Well, first of all, we can find the energy release in a gram, fissioning a gram of uranium 235, then a kilogram of uranium 235, and find out then how many kilograms will release. Uh, Enough energy, well, we go into that, I forget what we were looking at. Tons of, oh, TNT, uh, energy related to TNT. Okay, so that's continuing on that. What, what would I do for this? I forget. No, that's not even the right notes. Uh, 
Okay, so I could clean the board there. Maybe I will. Okay, TNT. What's TNT? We'll talk about what that is. TNT is a general explosive. Now the physicists were working away in Los Alamos and they had to uh, talk the language of the military. The military didn't talk in jewels, okay? The military talked, uh, when they talked about how big is that bomb over there, they would say, oh, it's uh, 500 tons of TNT, okay? The time uh, during World War II, the British had the biggest bomb. They stick, stuck it in an Avro Lancaster and hauled it over Germany and dropped it on poor individuals down there in Hamburg. Massive bomb, maybe one, one bomb per airplane. When a thousand bombs would have just done the same job. Anyway, trinitrotoluene is, uh, well, it's based on the benzene ring. Uh, what way does it go? Benzene. I think it's C6H6. Let's do the formula. Now benzene is extremely uh, Flammable. Okay, if you want to burn a building down using this stuff, it doesn't take much of it. So what we do is we'll take our benzene and we'll put in a couple of different things. Put CH3 up there. And we put a, a radical of carbon, no, what is it? NH, NO2, sorry. So this benzene becomes TNT, and TNT is an explosive. Actually, let's write the molecular formula. So we go C6, H1, must be another one, 1, 2, H2, uh, 1, 2, 3, NO3 twice. NO2. So that's the molecular formula for TNT. So it's still, as organic compounds go, still basically, uh, let's see how you would make it. Um, I, I guess you would mix benzene, methane, and Maybe nitric acid, I would think, would make TNT. And it becomes a great explosive bang, it goes off. The first atomic bombs were of the order of 20,000 tons of TNT. And then they went on and made H-bombs, which were too big. In actual fact, if you want to fight a war, the first ones are the most practical to do. So that's basically where we're heading. We're going to look at more details of this stuff now in a minute. I'll stop that part. There's a lot of weaponry in this, I'm sorry. Okay, so we continue. We're going to find out uh, the number of joules available per one kilogram of U235. Well, let's go ahead with that. Okay, so the energy from one kilogram of U35, what is it? One mole of U235 is 235 grams. And that's equivalent to Avogadro's number of nucleons. 6.022 by 10 to the power of 23 neutrons, each producing 170 MeV if they each get fissioned, okay? So 170 MeV is 170 by 10 to the power of 3 EV. So we'll convert the 170 MeV of server 
two joules. Now, to convert to joules, we use a unit factor. One electron volt is 1.6 by 10 to the power of minus 19 joules. This over this is equivalent to one. It's a conversion factor, it's a unit factor. This cancels out the EV, and then multiply 1.6 times 170, and then we go 10 to the power of three times 10 to the power of 19, and we get 16.38 by 10 to the power of 12 joules. You can check that at home, make sure I didn't make a mistake. So, <clears throat> That's the energy available from 235 grams, 235 grams of U35. 0.235 kilograms is the same as 235 grams. So now let's see, what about one gram? Well, divide this by 235 and we get the energy per gram. The energy per gram of fissioning U235 is 0 0.07 by 10 to the power of 12. I'm using joules. So everybody uses it EV. Now multiply this by 1,000 and we get the number of joules per kilogram. 7 by 10 to the power of 13 joules is the number of joules of energy available fissioning one kilogram of uranium-235. That's an extremely useful number. Now it's good enough for us physicists because we can talk joules. But the army talks tons of TNT. So we want to find out now how many tons of TNT is this equivalent to. And that's our next step. So I'll erase the board, put that calculation on the board. How many TNT tons is this in military language? Because they don't understand joules. Well, they do. But the average guy, the generals don't. The scientific people in the military are very good, by the way. The people in the Manhattan Project, the, uh, um, what was it? Army Corps of Engineers under General Leslie Groves, they were very capable people. Leslie Groves knew his whole way around. He wasn't supposed to be a scientist, but he could be if he wanted to be. And he was able to figure out what Oppenheimer and all the rest of them were up to and follow and supervise the whole kit and caboodle of them. That's coming up. We want to go into uh, tons of TNT now. Remember, TNT is trinitrotoluene. I had it on the board a minute ago. Um, I forget the formula. Now we'll finish up this by finding out how many tons of TNT, uh, equivalent explosives of TNT, can we get from one kilogram of uranium-235. So we're doing nuclear physics and explosives and weaponry still. Now, we found that seven by 10 to the power of three joules per kilogram is available from fissioning uh, one, one uh, kilogram of U-235. Now, server actually works in ergs per gram. I don't like ergs, so we have to convert. 7 by 10 to the power of 17 ergs per gram. Convert the ergs first. So a unit factor puts the ergs downstairs, and so 10 to the power of 7 ergs is 1 joule. 10 to the power of 7 ergs is 1 joule. That gets rid of the ergs. Now we get rid of the grams. 1 kilogram is 1,000 grams. That's the unit factor for the grams, we get rid of the grams. So we're left with 1,000 times 10 to the power of 17 divided by 10 to the power of 7. So 10 to, 7 by 10 to the power of 17 minus 7 plus 3 is the number of joules per kilogram, or 7 to the power of 13 joules per kilogram. So we agree with server, okay? Now for TNT, experimentally, and there's a, I'm not gonna go into all the details for this, but there is a way to find out how much energy is available from a ton of TNT, or a kilogram, or a gram even. Explode it and find out how much energy you get out of it. Put it into a container and see how much work it does. So 3.6 by 10 to the power of minus 19 joules is available per ton of TNT. Now this expresses it a different way in Starvin's work. He, once again, like I said, he does ergs and whatnot. So we'll stick with joules and uh, tons. So. 7 by 10 to the power of 10 joules per gram is the same as 7 by 10 to the power of 13 joules per kilogram. So we both agree with that. We're in the same boat here. So how many, uh, how many tons of TNT is that? That's one kilogram. It's a big number. Um, it's about a thousand times more than this number. 13, we want to subtract 9. That into that is about two, so it's going to be 20,000 tons. You can see this already, right? A thousand. 
That and that goes too. It's 20,000 tonnes of TNT. But we'll go through the calculation anyway. So 7 over 3.6 is the first part, and then 30 minus 9 is 1.94, 1.94, approximately 2, like I said, by 10 to the power of 4, which is 19.4 by 10 to the power of 3, 20,000. 20,000 tonnes of TNT is available from fissioning 1 kilogram of uranium-235. So now we know what the weapon does, okay? So that's how you can go, you can go and talk the military into, you know, using this. Actually, the scientists pushed for this. There was so much momentum. Once the Manhattan Project got started and they set up factories in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and what's that other one up in Washington State? I forget. And then uh, the one down in Los Alamos. And there were thousands of people involved in this and billions of dollars spent in the, in, in the money of today, many billions of dollars. Uh, that So the project was underway. It wasn't a question of deciding the bomb, should the bomb be dropped. It was a question of when can we drop it? Some people were saying, let's, ho let's hope we can drop it before the war is over. Vengeance was afoot because of the march to Bataan and a whole lot of other things. The attack in Pearl Harbor, Harbor even. So what was the other various atrocities committed all over the place. Anyway, the Japanese were in the bad books and so they wanted to but the war was all the, the Japanese military people might not have surrendered actually I think don't think they would have they would have fought to the last Japanese um, civilian the Japanese military and uh, then they would have committed the hirikiri or harikari or whatever it is themselves Sep Sep sepulchre what is it I forget sepulchre is a tomb so it can't be that but it's close to that anyway let them do that if they want to that's my attitude it save us the trouble but uh, one bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and did terrible damage. And you know, the way Hiroshima got bombed was all accidental. It was one of the last uh, cities chosen as a target. A lot of people want, the military wanted Kyoto chosen as a target in Japan because Kyoto was full of uh, all the, the old uh, Shinto shrines and it's full of history. And it would have been a great blow to the Japanese to have bombed that. A lot of the military wanted to bomb the emperor out of it. They wanted to bomb, find out where he was in or around Tokyo and bomb that place, that whole region, and send a message. So the military didn't get away with it because the State Department did not want to destroy Kyoto. Yeah? And uh, they, of course they were the boss. Stimson, Henry, the Secretary of War, he had been to Kyoto as far as I remember. And he, he, he liked, didn't want to be responsible for destroying that ancient city. But the military didn't care. They, would, would have, they, want, they promised ruin from the sky. Actually, uh, FDR promised, not FDR, Truman promised ruin from the sky. And they got it. They got it uh, in the Hiroshima. And the misery of the people of Hiroshima was untold after that. Laid at the feet of their military. They probably didn't, some of them didn't even know there was a war on. Doesn't matter. That country supported their military, and they let the military away with it. They let the, the emperor was responsible for the war, by the way, and that wasn't discussed after the war because MacArthur wanted them left in power to keep the country stable. And MacArthur had a famous photograph of himself taken with the emperor, and MacArthur was standing there on the victorious side. The Japanese knew this. Uh, the Americans wouldn't have known this, that the victor stands on a certain side. and. Uh, the emperor comes up to about here on MacArthur. MacArthur's only about six, one or two, so that the emperor must have been tiny. Anyway, there he was, the little brat, and he was just uh, started this war and kept it going. He would have kept it going forever to defend his own um, life. Uh, MacArthur let him have it. I'm, I'm, he took his power away, but he let him. He let him live. He, he remained an emperor as, as a figurehead. And then, you know, the amazing thing about this country was we went into Germany, defeated the Germans with the help of the British, but the Americans really did it. And <coughs> the bombings, night, daylight and nighttime raids, well, they both, both did it, I guess. And then, uh, what? Definitely, uh, America defeated Japan, definitely. And they already had defeated them on the ground, but the invasion of the, Ameri the Japanese homeland would have been horrendous. I do believe that the two atomic bombs gave the emperor an excuse to surrender and keep some kind of face. Without those, he would have dragged on the war for a long time. Yeah, he didn't like the idea of surrender, but he was kind of forced into it under the onslaught of defeat 
and then of course the bombs just gave them that extra excuse. A horrendous loss of life. They say uh, 100,000 lives lost after Hiroshima, at Hiroshima. I think it's more like 300,000. If you estimate the number of people over a year or so who are going to die of radiation poisoning, and then throw in another similar figure from uh, Nagasaki, right? There was a third bomb ready to go, and some people wanted to go ahead with it, you know, and they were hoping that the Japanese wouldn't surrender yet, so we get rid of this one. But then they surrendered, and they didn't get to drop the third one. I don't know where that one would have gone. This one would have gone to Kyoto. The third one, definitely. Because if it was dragged into a situation with the third war, Kyoto or, or Tokyo would have got the third one. And they were, in the, they were in the capacity now to make plutonium bombs, that's the implosion bomb, at the rate of one per month. Right? They had three now, and they had already tested one, so that was four. But now they had to start manufacturing again. Uh, Oak Ridge and what's the other one? I keep forgetting that place, the third venue. Never mind, enough said of that, and let's finish this talk up right now. I hope you guys got the picture. These are very simple calculations. However, if you're on your own and you have to go through them, you'll get, it's, you'll take you a while. I just saved you some time by just doing them out. And showing how you can take something simple like Avogadro's number and work out the number of Joules of energy, hence tons of TNT available from fissioning one kilogram of uh, uranium-235, fissionable using slow neutrons.